Welcome back. This is video lecture chapter 6 on genetic analysis and mapping in bacteria and bacteriophages. The chapter discusses the different mechanisms available to scientists to map the position of genes along chromosomes of bacteria and also of bacteriophages, viruses which infect bacteria. Some of the latter slides are not included in the examination for this course. The chapter is divided into six sections, and many of these slides are very simple and just refer to diagrams. So the actual length of the PowerPoint, even though it's at 120 slides, is really about 70 slides. Because bacteria do not exactly follow the same biological processes in eukaryotes, they have to be analyzed using special techniques. Their genetic material is the same, but the way that they manipulate their genetic material is different, as well as its evolution. There are certain aspects of bacteria that make them very useful to genetic analysis. The first is they have simple genomes, both with shorter chromosomes and fewer genes. In addition, most species of bacteria are haploid. That means they have one copy of every chromosome so that mutant alleles can be easily identified. And lastly, they have short generation times. So in the course of an hour, you could get a couple of or three generations of bacteria produced. The list of usefulness goes on. They can produce large numbers of offspring very quickly per generation. And they can be grown very easily on simple media containing either broth solutions or petri dishes or in slant tubes. And they have numerous heritable differences so that mutations can be easily created, isolated, and examined for further genetic studies. Bacteria don't use the mitosis or meiosis methods of reproduction. They go through something called binary fission, where the process is very simple. You copy your DNA, you stretch the cell, you send one copy one way, the other copy the other way, then you divide the cell in the middle. And that leads to the production of offspring, and those offspring can double every generation to produce a colony in a matter of a single day that's visible to the human eye. And all the cells in that colony are mostly of the same genetic composition, but they may contain a number of mutants. And lastly, bacteria can be grown, as we said earlier, on, in liquid or solid media. And they normally require very simple sources of nutrients. They need a carbon source, normally glucose, a nitrogen source, so they can make amino acids, and water, as well as a few other vitamins and minerals. Figure 6.1 shows the two alternatives normally used for growing bacteria. This is a liquid culture, and this is a solid media upon which the bacteria grow. At this point, it's very important for one to realize that the type of media used can be also used to identify mutants. Bacteria come in various types. Some can grow on simple media and make everything they need using those simple molecules. Others need to be supplied with special chemicals that they can't manufacture themselves. So if a bacteria contains all the genes that is normally present in the wild type, that organism is said to be prototrophic. prototrophic. And those bacteria are called prototrophs. They can grow on minimum media. And all that media needs to contain is glucose, a nitrogen source, some inorganic material, and water. In comparison, auxotrophs are mutant bacteria. They have either a mutation in one pathway or more that prevents them from growing on minimum media. Now, unless they are grown on complete media, they can be grown on minimum media if it is supplemented by the addition of a chemical in the pathway beyond the point at which they're missing something, i.e. downstream of the mutant location. By plating bacteria on different types of media, one can identify the genotype of that bacterial strain. For instance, some bacteria can grow on glucose others can grow on lactose. And the ones that cannot grow on lactose but do grow on glucose are called lac minus. One way to identify if a particular colony of bacteria is able to grow on different media 
is to be able to replicate plate. That means transfer using some kind of a material. In this case, this sterile velvet is used to transfer from the original plate where the colonies are growing onto new plates, and these new plates may contain different types of media. And therefore, any colony that doesn't grow here, indicated by these two arrows, and did grow on the original plate, would be some type of auxotrope. Replica plating is simply a technique to make copies of the original plate so that you can test for further mutants. Some simple observations pertaining to bacterial genomes. In most cases, the genomes are a single chromosome in length. And these chromosomes carry the most essential genes for allowing that bacterial strain to grow. The bacterial chromosome is usually a circular closed molecule covalently closed circle, CCC, and it's double-stranded DNA, unlike our chromosomes, which are linear chromosomes with two ends. The bacterial chromosome, in comparison to ours, is usually quite small, possessing from a few hundred thousand base pairs to several million base pairs, depending on the bacterial species. In this particular figure, we can see the original bacterial cell in white, and that cell has been ruptured by using detergents. And that allows the DNA in this nucleoid to spill out into the environment. And we can see the DNA, the single chromosome, in its, with its many loops. In addition, the scientists have color-coded the plasmids as red. So this particular bacteria, as far as we can tell, contains seven plasmids. Plasmids are extra-chromosomal circular DNA, carrying additional genes. The plasmids don't carry any essential genes for maintaining the life cycle of the bacteria. They normally carry additional genes that convey some type of advantage in certain environments. Now, plasmid DNA is considerably smaller than the chromosomal DNA, as we saw in the figure. And many kinds of naturally occurring plasmids are found amongst species of bacteria some conveying resistance to antibiotics, others, others promoting transfer of genetic material between neighboring bacterial cells. The prefix to the name of the plasmid gives a clue as to what that plasmid does for that bacterial host. So F stands for fertility, R stands for resistance to antibiotics. Plasmids fall into two classifications when it comes to their number within the bacterial cell. Some are high copy number, that means they can replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome and may reach two to 400 copies per cell. Others are low copy number, where the plasmid is tied to the replication of the bacterial chromosome itself and their copy number may be one or two copies per cell. The next section of the chapter talks about conjugation. Conjugation is simply the ability of a bacterial cell to transfer material from one to a neighboring cell. And the way that this process works, as we'll see over the next few slides, is that it's a one-way transfer of genetic material from the donor cell to the recipient cell. But once the recipient cell has received its copy of the genetic material, it may become a donor cell itself. So you can see if this happens in a hospital setting, one cell with a resistant antibiotic plasmid can spread that to others and then it became, becomes a tsunami that spreads throughout the environment. In some circumstances, this conjugation can lead to not just a transfer of a plasmid, but a portion of the bacterial chromosome, and in other cases, both. And this has consequences for the evolution of bacterial cells. With most cases, the DNA that's transferred is a copy, not a transfer directly. So it's a copy and paste rather than a cut and paste mechanism. Conjugation is one of three major processes that have been identified in prokaryotes for transferring genetic information in a horizontal fashion. That means across from individuals rather than through inheritance, through reproduction. It's very important that you don't forget the differences and the similarities between these three processes. And we're going to talk at length for each one in the upcoming slides.
So conjugation is the transfer of replicated DNA from a donor cell to a recipient cell by direct cell-to-cell -cell contact. Transformation is where DNA that's floating around free in the environment is absorbed into the cell through the cell wall. And transduction is the transfer of DNA by viral vectors. So viruses can pick up accidentally uh, DNA from one bacterium and transfer that to another. Please remember all three processes. Figure 6.4 attempts to relay the same information in a graphical format. So we have conjugation in the top row, we have transformation in the middle row, and we have transduction in the bottom row. Please try to remember what's happening in each case. The donor chromosome is in red and the recipient cell's DNA is in blue. Study these figures carefully. We have to give credit historically to two scientists that first identified conjugation. Ledenberg and Tatum in 1946 published data where they were able to show that two auxotrophic strains of bacteria, culture one and culture two, when mixed together in equal proportions, produced a third culture, culture three. And all three were initially grown on complete media to increase their number. And then cells from each culture were transferred to minimum media. And then they looked at what would happen. Upon examination of the three types of culture on minimum media, they did not see any growth with culture one or culture two alone. But the plate for culture three developed a number of colonies that had acquired the ability to grow in a prototrophic fashion. That means they somehow became wild type. The reversion of mutants to wild type was not the explanation because they could not see any, any of that taking place in the first two cultures. So they concluded that there must have been some type of physical transfer between the cells, between culture one and culture two, which was responsible for the phenotype seen in culture three. Figure 6.5 lays out the experiment conducted by Ledenberg and Tatum. We can see the three test tubes that they had. This one contained pure culture one, this one pure culture two, this one was a mixture of the two cultures, Y24 and Y10. Then they plated all th three onto uh, these minimum media plates. There was no growth here because this strain was an auxotroph. There's no growth here because this strain, Y10, was an auxotroph. But the mixture of Y24 and Y10 produced some colonies that could grow. So they concluded that something was being transferred between the two cultures. The second set of experiments performed by Davis supported the principle of contact necessary between these cells in order to transfer material, genetic material, from one strain to the other. He used a standard available apparatus known as a U-tube, which normally has a filter halfway down its uh, base, and that filter prevents the movement of cells but it doesn't stop the movement of smaller molecules. First, he repeated Lindenberg's and Tatum's experiment, and he also included his glass YouTube experiment. And in this case, he was unable to get any colonies to grow on minimum media. The only plate on which the experiment proved to be positive was in a mixture of the two types of cells. Therefore, confirming that bacteria need to make direct contact with their neighbors in order to transfer material. The glass filter was too wide to allow cells on one side to make contact with cells on the other side. This real picture shows a set of cells making contact using this protein tube called a sex pillus. A number of years later, another scientist, William Hayes, re discovered the experiments of Ledenberg and Tatum and the data from Davis's experiments and he concluded that the transfer of information from one strain to the other was not equal. There wasn't a two-way pathway. 
in most cases, information was flowing from one strain to the other in every case. And this one-way transfer of genetic information then allowed him to donate some cells as donors and other cells as recipients. He further proposed that the ability to act as a donor was based on some genetic factor, some hereditary factor that could be then passed through to your offspring. And they also had the ability to perform this type of genetic transfer. So he labeled that a fertility factor. And that's where the label comes from these days because of this historical nature of the genetic experimentation. The F comes from the word fertility. Cells that do not have the potential to transfer information from them to neighboring cells are known as F minus cells because they lack the F factor. Whereas those cells that can transfer information are called F plus cells and the F plus stands for the fertility factor. We now know that conjugation is controlled by genes carried on a plasmid, the F plasmid. The expression of some of these genes is directly responsible for producing structures that aid first in the duplication of the F factor and then its transfer to the recipient cell. One of these protein complexes produced from the F factor is called a relaxosome. A relaxosome. And the relaxosome cuts one strand of the double stranded plasmid and that triggers DNA replication and the movement of the copy of the F factor to the recipient cell. Once the transfer is complete, the recipient cell becomes known as an X conjugate cell because it too has now acquired the ability to make its own F factor and transfer that to other bacteria that lack it. In E. coli, the F factor is about 100,000 base pairs in length and it encodes about 40 genes that are responsible for controlling conjugation. The F plasmid structure contains some interesting components. It contains an origin of replication. It contains some insertion sequence elements. And it contains those 40 or so different genes, the functions of which are now known. These IS elements are pretty important, so let's focus in on those. So a large proportion of the F factor consists of four of these insertion sequences. And these insertion sequences are regions of that DNA that have some homology to similar sequences within the bacterial main chromosome. These regions of DNA homology between the F factor and the chromosomal DNA are the regions where recombination between the two takes place once a copy is transferred into the recipient cell. The sex pillars that we spoke about earlier can also be known as a conjugation pillars. That's the structure, the tube, that's connecting one donor cell to one recipient cell. And through the middle of that tube is a hollow cavity where the relaxosome binds to the origin of transfer and initiates the transfer of one strand of the plasmid to the recipient cell. The mechanism by which the F plasmid single strand of DNA is replicated is called the rolling circle replication mechanism, which results in a copy being transferred and the original staying within the donor cell. Figure 6.8 relays this information. The F factor is in red, is double-stranded DNA, and when conditions are ripe, the relaxosome forms, and a copy of the DNA is separated from its complementary strand, and a rolling circle method of replication ensues right here so that the original plasmid is kept intact as a double-stranded molecule, but a copy, a single-strand copy is sent through the conjugation tube to the recipient cell. And in the recipient cell, the normal enzymes of that cell uh, capture the single strand of DNA and generate a double strand molecule, which is then ligated together to form a circular plasmid. Table 6.1 is a little premature in the order of things, but we'll talk about the second and third row 
in the coming slides, but let's just concentrate on the first row. What it says is a bacterial cell that's F plus when incubated with F minus cells that will result in the transfer of information from the F plus to the F minus. And in the process, none of the bacterial genes are transferred, just the genes on the F plasmid. The F plus and F minus conjugation is the normal, most common method by which F plasmids are transferred between bacteria. But occasionally, a alternative process which is much rarer, takes place. And that is what is responsible for the observations of Ledenberg and Tatum that we talked about earlier in this video lecture. So that alternative type of conjugation explains how genes from the chromosome of the donor cell can be passed into the recipient cell. Cells which can transfer their own bacterial genes are known as high frequency of recombination strains or HFR. And going back to this previous table, we're now going to talk about row number two. So in HFR conditions, the F plasmid has become integrated into the bacteria's own chromosome, forming a high frequency of recombination chromosome. As we said a few seconds back, this occurs very rarely, but it does happen. And the responsible party are the IS elements, insertion sequence elements, that are common between the F plasmid and the bacterial chromosome. And the location at which this integration occurs is at these multiple IS sites. A single plasmid may be inserted in one of two directions using any one of its four IS elements or combined with any of the IS elements on the bacterial chromosome again in either direction. So there's many possibilities. So for, for various strains of bacteria, uh, the HFR strains, there could be a distinct orientation and a distinct location where you find the F plasmid. Figure 6.9 shows a depiction of a red plasmid being integrated into the blue bacterial chromosome using the common IS elements on both these DNA entities. Regular crossing over takes place with a single crossover event, and a single crossover event between two circular molecules results in the formation of a giant circular molecule. Conjugation between an HFR strain and an F- strain results in the transfer of some of the genes from the bacterial chromosome of the donor cell, but never the complete transfer of the bacterial chromosome due to the fact that it's quite large and the conjugation pillars is unstable. The process of copying the plasmid and the bacterial chromosome is the same. This occurs by the rolling circle replication mechanism. And as the beginning of the plasmid begins to transfer itself through the conjugation pillars, it takes with it the chromosomal DNA. The entry of a segment of the transferred chromosome results in it becoming double-stranded, but it stays as a linear fragment because it cannot circularize. And the reason for that is the far end of the F plasmid that contains the necessary elements to cause the molecule to become a circle has not been transferred into this cell. However, the linear chromosome does line up with its homologous regions on the bacterial chromosome. And by the mechanism of homologous recombination, the, the new fragment can be swapped into the bacterial chromosome, therefore giving the exconjugant cell uh, new acquired genes that were not present on its own chromosome prior to the conjugation event. Figure 6.10 tries to convey that information. So here we have a HFR chromosome, and the red segment represents the plasmid integrated into the bacterial blue chromosome. The recipient cell happens to have a plasmid present in its cytosol as well as its, as well as its chromosome, 
Doing conjugation, a small section of this chromosome is copied over. And you can see that it contains a small fragment of the F factor here in red. And then you have the light blue, which represents the sequence of this part of the chromosome here. So it begins at the origin of transfer, O-R-I-T, and it goes in this clockwise direction. But at a certain point in time, the conjugation event is terminated. So only these two genes have managed to cross over to the recipient cell. Regardless, the linear piece of DNA that just came in is double-stranded now, and is able to perform uh, a recombination event, homologous recombination. And that leads to the transformation of this cell with the phenotype of these two genes. The method to isolate or select for bacteria that contain this phenotype away from cells that contain this phenotype or that phenotype is to grow them on the appropriate minimum media containing supplements of those particular chemicals. These selection experiments are paramount in identifying by growth on selected media the exconjugate cells with specific genotypes. In addition to using nutrient agar, we can also use antibiotic selection mechanisms. The addition of this parameter to the experiment leads to better outcomes, and that's the reason why we have the R plasmid in the recipient cell, because this medium here contains an antibiotic which will prevent the growth of these cells. Several genetic principles are illustrated by these type of matings between HFR and F- strains. These type of matings can transfer alleles of one strain of bacteria to the other, and the recipient chromosome does so by homologous recombination with the incoming fragment of DNA. The formation of exconjugate chromosomes then leads to the transformation of the donor cell. The F factor is not fully transferred during the mating, and the recipient cell is not converted into a donor cell because of its lack of the far end of the F factor. Geneticists have in the past made use of HFR strains and the ability to transfer chromosomes in order to map the distance between genes on the bacterial or plasmid chromosome. This is an ingenious application of what's known to happen naturally. Recall that we said that for a particular strain of HFR, the plasmid is always incorporated into the same location and in the same direction in the chromosome of the bacteria. So if these strains are used for different experiments, one can interrupt the conjugation event after a certain period of time and to see then which genes have transferred. And by doing this at timed intervals and then comparing the results, one can not only determine the order in which the genes are present on the bacterial chromosome in the donor, but also how far apart they are based on the number of minutes that have passed since the conjugation event started. The genes closest to the original transfer on the bacterial chromosome would be transferred very early in this conjugation event. In 1956, Woolman, Jacob and Hayes used the time of entry mapping experiments to determine the location and order of genes on bacterial chromosomes. Gene mapping experiments in bacteria are useful in determining the organization of genes on the chromosome. These experiments rely on the ability of genes to be transferred between different bacterial strains. Conjugation is a process whereby DNA is transferred through direct contact between a donor bacterium and a recipient bacterium. E. coli genes can be mapped genetically using conjugation. Genes are transferred in one direction from a donor strain to a recipient strain, and recombinants are seen in the recipient soon after a gene enters. By timing the appearance of recombinants, the order of genes and their relative distances apart can be determined. The donor is a high-frequency recombination strain.
An HFR strain has the F factor integrated into the chromosome. The F factor controls the mating between the two cells and the transfer of genes from donor to recipient. The recipient is an F minus cell. It has a chromosome but no F factor. Let's look at a typical interrupted mating experiment. The donor HFR strain consists of the wild type alleles for the following genes HFR, THR+, LU+, AZR, TONR, LAC+, GAL+, while the recipient strain contained mutant alleles for these genes as follows F-, THR-, LU-, AZS, TONS, LAC-, Gal minus. The two strains are mixed together in a nutrient medium at 37 degrees Celsius. Every few minutes, samples are removed and then agitated in a blender to break the pairs of cells apart. The cells are plated on a selective medium designed to allow recombinant types to grow and to select against HFR and F minus parental types. The recombinants are then tested for the genes that have come from the donor. After 8 minutes, the first donor genes, 3 plus and LU plus, are transferred from the HFR to the F minus in this cross. These genes are detected as recombinants after donor and recipient are broken apart by the ability of the cells to grow in the absence of threonine and leucine. The two genes are too close to one another to determine which gene is first. The next gene transferred is AZR at 9 minutes. This tells us that the AZ gene is located on the bacterial chromosome one minute after the 3 and LU genes. Recombinants for this gene are detected by the ability of cells to grow in the presence of the inhibitor sodium azide in the medium. Next, the TUN-R gene is transferred at 10 minutes. This tells us that the TUN gene is located on the bacterial chromosome two minutes after the 3 and LU genes and one minute after the AZ gene. Recombinants for this gene are detected by testing for resistance to infection by phage T1. The next gene transferred is LAC+, and it appears in the F- cell 16 minutes after conjugation began. The LAC gene is 6 minutes away from the TON gene. Recombinants for this gene are detected by testing for the ability of cells to use lactose as a carbon source. The final gene to be transferred to the F- strain is the GAL plus gene at 25 minutes. Thus, this gene is 9 minutes away from the LAC gene. Recombinants for this gene are detected by testing for the ability of cells to use galactose as a carbon source. In this interrupted mating experiment, each gene appears at a different time, indicating its relative position on the bacterial chromosome. The map units between genes are expressed in minutes. The entire E. coli chromosome requires about 100 minutes to transfer all of its DNA. Table 6.2 reiterates the abbreviations used in the video and the biochemical outcomes. The time of entry maps can also be converted to graphical data where the conjugation time is related to the frequency of the transfer of those markers into recombinant bacterial recipients. Figure 6.11b just reiterates what we saw on the video and the time that it takes to transfer that particular gene into the recipient cell from the donor. And Figure C shows us the map generated from this particular strain of E. coli with the minutes given in the middle. The video further alludes to the fact that for a particular strain of HFR, the extent to which these experiments can be measured is limited by the time that conjugation lasts. So a single HFR strain can only give you a limited impact on the transfer of a chromosome and its mapping. But by using many different strains of E. coli or other bacterial species, one can obtain these compounded maps that can then be integrated, consolidated. The consolidation process is pretty straightforward where you get information from different strains and you overlap that information hopefully in a walking experiment. The goal is to piece together the information coming from different strains
such that you get back full circle to the original gene at the beginning of this circular chromosome. This is the same data orientated with respect to the known position of these genes on a bacterial chromosome. Here we have the consolidated map showing where each HFR strain initiates transfer and the direction in which it does so. And the result of all that is that we get this consolidated HS HFR map of E. coli, which shows the position of all the genes over a 100 minute time period. And if we zoom in on one area, we can see how much detail has been gathered from these consolidation maps. If we return now to table 6.1, we should understand the second row. This high frequency of recombination strain mixed with an F minus strain. This answer of no simply means that the F minus recipient is not converted itself into a plus F plus because not the entire F factor is transferred into it. And the donor bacterial genes are transferred to this X conjugate and the answer is yes. Now let's turn our attention to the last row in table 6.1. The F prime donor is a bacteria in which it did have the F factor integrated into the bacterial chromosome but when the F factor plasmid deintegrated, excised itself, that excision was imperfect and it removed some of the genes from the chromosome and therefore became an F prime factor. So F prime factors contain their own DNA plus a segment of the bacterial chromosome. And now when these cells are conjugated with F minus cells, they do transfer their F factor plus these genes from the bacterial chromosome into the recipient cell. These transfers result in the recipient cell now having two copies of these genes that have been brought in by the F prime factor. So they are called partial diploids. And this is very useful because scientists can now examine the relationship between the two sets of genes, as we have in the previous looked at the lac opron. Figure 613a demonstrates a F factor excision event from an HFR chromosome. Here's your HFR chromosome. The F factor sits right here. Under normal excision, the F factor would be precisely excised out, leaving the bacterial chromosome completely intact. But in aberrant excision or imperfect excision, uh, you can see the excision of the plasmid is imperfect and it takes with it some of the genes from the bacterial chromosome. Figure 613b then shows what happens when the F prime cell transfers this plasmid to a F minus recipient cell. And the transfer results in a partial diploid for the genes encoded in the two blue regions. So the phenotype of this cell has been converted from LAC minus to LAC plus, because LAC plus is dominant to LAC minus. Let's consider an aside. Let's apply these same principles and see if archaea, the other domain of prokaryotes, whether they perform and possess a similar architecture. So archaea are similar to bacteria. They are normally single-celled haploid organisms, usually with a single chromosome and multiple plasmids. So they have single chromosomes in most cases, with a few exceptions, and they have multiple plasmids. Now, dozens and dozens of different archaeal plasmids have been discovered, and they resemble bacterial plasmids in their ability to confer either metabolic or biochemical functions. Most archaeal plasmids display also the rolling circle replication mechanism of duplication and are driven by plasmid conjugation.
The overlap suggests many similarities to bacterial conjugation, but further research is required to elucidate the evolutionary background from where these came from. Let's turn our attention now to the second process of general transfer of material between cells, that of transformation. So transformation occurs when a particular cell is able to take up from its environment DNA. Where did that DNA come from? Well, in many cases it comes from dead or dying bacteria, but in other circumstances it can come from many other sources, including eukaryotes. The good news is that even this process can be used to produce maps of bacterial genes. Incidentally, this is a very common mechanism used by researchers to transform bacteria with DNA. The mechanism of transformation has four discrete steps, which are preceded by lysis and the breakage of the donor cell and the fragmentation of the DNA into the environment. And once that DNA hits the environment, then it can be taken up by the recipient cell. During the process of entry, the pores in the bacterial cell wall and bacterial membrane are sufficiently wide to allow one strand of DNA, of double-stranded DNA, to enter. So the second strand is left outside and degraded. The strand that gains entry to the bacterial cell then can bind with complementary base pairs to the recipient chromosome. Figure 614 shows the first couple of steps of the transformation process. Double-stranded DNA is picked up by the receptor site, which is quite complex, as we can see here. And we have the cell wall of the bacteria and the cell membrane. And these proteins form a channel, and the DNA is imported through the channel. But only one strand is allowed to enter the cytosol, the other strand being degraded by special enzymes embedded in the plasma membrane. The entry of the one strand of DNA can cause a displacement loop in the corresponding region of the bacterial host chromosome. The result is a formation of a heteroduplex between one strand of the host DNA and the incoming strand of DNA. What happens next is quite complicated. Following DNA replication and cell division, one of the daughter cells of this parent cell will be transformed and it's called the transformant, and the other daughter cell retains the recipient chromosome, the original recipient chromosome, and thus is unchanged. And that's illustrated in this figure. This is the transformant that has assimilated the incoming DNA, whereas this is the non-transformant that retains the original information of the recipient cell. The docking proteins that take in DNA from the environment have a capacity to bring in DNA no bigger than 100,000 base pairs, so relatively short. And in the case of E. coli, these fragments may contain up to 50 genes along a size of fragment this big. That would only represent a tiny fraction of the total genome of the recipient cell, maybe one or two percent. So transformation itself is not important in changing the chromosome of a recipient cell entirely, but only small fragments. Transformation is more useful for genetics because it allows mapping of genes that are closely linked. Such genes that reside close together are said to be co-transformed through a process called co-transformation. That makes sense. The next section of the chapter deals with the third mechanism that allows bacterial cells to be changed, and that's called transduction, bacterial transduction. Transduction differs from the other two processes in that it requires the mediation of a virus. And the viruses that infect bacterial cells have a name. They're called bacteriophages. With transduction, a mistake is made in the transfer of information via the virus. 
And that those mistakes are paramount in enabling geneticists to then investigate the order of genes on the original bacterial chromosome. Before we get into the mapping aspect of this technology, let's have a look at some basic life cycles of these bacterial viruses, the bacteriophages. So bacteriophages are tiny viral particles that consist normally of a protein icosahedral head, a hollow protein sheath, and sometimes tail fibers. So all these are protein components. Then within the head, there will be normally a single chromosome of between 5,000 and 100,000 base pairs of nucleic acid. That could be RNA or DNA. The information that's carried by the chromosome is normally for directing the host cell to express certain enzymes and factors. So this DNA doesn't have to be, or RNA doesn't have to be that influential in terms of carrying its own genes. It just takes over the biological machinery of the host cell. Two very common phage types, T4 and lambda phage, are illustrated here and shown to be binding to their respective cell surfaces. Not all the elements we spoke about are present on the lambda phage. However, T4 has all the parts. So here are the tail fibers. There's your sheath. There's your head. And then within that, you have your nucleic acid. Both of these happen to be DNA viruses. Different viral types have evolved different mechanisms to attack and be released from their host cells. But there are some commonalities. All mechanisms involve these viruses seeking out and attaching to host cells across their surface. And in all cases, such attachments begin the process of the lytic cycle that leads to the production of more viral particles and then the eventual lysis of the bacterial host cell that then releases the progeny phase to restart the whole infection cycle. The lytic cycle, the cycle that leads to the lysis of a cell, has six discrete steps. The first is the attachment of the phage to the host cell. We just mentioned that. The second step is the delivery of the phage chromosome into the cytosol of the host cell, where it normally then circularizes by cohesive ends that it has. Then replication of the phage DNA begins, utilizing the biochemical machinery of the host cell. Then transcription and translation of phage genes is prioritized and that leads to the production of all the parts necessary to assemble the progeny phage. The packaging of the phage chromosome into these protein phage heads. And then the lysis of the host cell and the release of progeny particles. For some bacteriophages, they also have the ability to adopt one of two pathways when they infect their host cells. And those are called temperate phages. In the lytic cycle, the DNA or RNA of the phage is assimilated into the chromosome of the host. And it can persist in this for a number of cell cycles until conditions become more favorable for the release of progeny phage from this bacterial cell. But eventually everything will end at some time in the lytic cycle being triggered. Figure 616 does a nice job of illustrating both pathways, the lytic pathway and the lysogenic pathway. Both eventually will lead to cell death. The lysogenic cycle shares a couple of steps with the lytic cycle in that attachment of the phage particle to the host cell is required. 
and injection of the phage DNA into the host is also necessary. But what happens next is different. The integration of the phage chromosome into the host chromosome takes place utilizing enzymes that are brought in by the incoming phage. Once that integration takes place, the phage DNA is known as a prophage. And that will stay in its place until conditions are suitable. And then excision of the prophase will take place. And then at that point, the lytic cycle will resume, leading to the release of progeny phage. In some exceptional cases, we have a mistake where random pieces of the donor bacterial DNA are accidentally packaged into some of the progeny phage heads. Now, this error occurs more frequently in some bacteriophages than others, and P1 happens to be one that is pretty weak at doing its job correctly. And that happens to pick up approximately 100,000 base pairs of information from E. coli every time it travels from a host cell to another host cell. So P1 is considered a prolific producer of generalized transduction. There's a pathway that generalized transduction also follows that begins at the surface where the P1 attaches to the donor bacterium, the E. coli, and it injects its DNA into the cell. Replication of the phage chromosome is followed by transcription and translation to produce phage proteins. Progeny phage are assembled normally, but some phage receive host DNA fragments instead of phage DNA. And when that packaging is complete, the host cell lysis, because of the action of the normal phage, and release into the environment, which would include the small proportion of generalized transduced phage, the ones that contain accidentally fragments of the host bacterial chromosome. Figure 617 walks us through the first few steps, and the second half of the figure tells us how this process can be utilized in general transduction. In the first sequence of events, we have a bacterial chromosome that carries two mutations. Upon P1 infection, the biochemical process will result in the fractionation, the fragmentation of the bacterial chromosome, and that will accidentally be picked up by some phage particles, and those are known as transducing phage, but the vast majority will be normal phage. The normal phage will result in the lysis of the cell, also releasing the transducing phage particles. Those transducing phage particles, if they happen to land on the surface of a recipient cell, will inject the part of the bacterial chromosome that they picked up accidentally into the recipient cell. So the donor DNA and the recipient DNA will have homologous recombination take place and they may end up transferring and transforming these cells using the same principles that we discovered in the previous two events. If two genes happen to be close together on the bacterial chromosome, the chances are that when the bacterial chromosome fragments, they will be part of the same fragment and end up being packaged into the same phage and co-transduce the recipient cell. So co-transduction is normally used as a term to express the relationship between two closely related genes. The degree of co-transduction therefore indicates the map distance between two genes. Once you study enough populations of this transduction, generalized transduction, you will end up with maps that will then agree or not agree with physical maps. And that's what we can do these days. We can take these old genetic maps and then relate them to physical maps that have been generated using newer technologies
where we can sequence the entire chromosome on a single machine in a few hours. The next section of the chapter deals with bacteriophage chromosomes and how they are important in fine structure analysis. All we need to know from this section is that from a historical perspective, before DNA was identified as the molecule of inheritance, people didn't understand what genes were. Could genes be all or nothing? Or did they have internal parts that could each be changed? And experiments conducted by Seymour Benzer were instrumental in showing that genes do, in fact, have internal fine structure. So the questions he focused on during his experiments were, could components of genes be mutated? Or was the gene the fundamental unit of mutation, i.e., once a gene is mutated, it's mutated? Or could you have alleles of a gene that carry different types of mutations along the length of the DNA for that particular gene? Further, he wanted to know if recombination was taking place among genes, or could it occur within genes as well? His multiple experiments with phage led him to publish his fine structure map in 1961, which showed that for the two genes that he studied in detail, he was able to identify over 1,600 point mutations. And these mutations were scattered throughout each of these two genes, suggesting that genes are composed of individual mutable subunits, which we now call nucleotides. And the distribution of the mutations is not random, along the length of these genes. His research suggested that there were mutational hotspots, and he indicated those by using triangles of different sizes. So each of these points that we see a little blob or a large blob indicates the degree to which that area is susceptible to mutation. So this mutational hotspot here is extremely susceptible to change compared to other regions the final part of the chapter talks about lateral gene transfer. In genetics, there's two types of genetic movement. One is between children and parents and grandchildren. And that's known as vertical gene transfer. The other type, which comes by two different names, horizontal or lateral gene transfer. You can use horizontal in here if you wish. It means the same thing. So we'll stick with the terminology used by the textbook. Lateral means sideways, so from one cell to another through transformation, transduction, and conjugation. This transfer is not restricted just amongst bacteria. It can also take place between bacteria and archaea, or between bacteria and other organisms, including eukaryotes. In fact, this mechanism may have been responsible for generating 12% of the genes that we find in various organisms. The types of genes that are most susceptible to lateral gene transfer have to do with the ability to transfer DNA across species. And that makes sense. So DNA binding proteins, uh, surface proteins, and pathogenicity are all interrelated in increasing the scope of DNA to transform other types of cells. Indeed, we have discovered that these transfers between bacteria and eukaryotes have been instrumental in shaping the forms of life that we have today. The two paramount examples that the textbook gives us is that of endosymbiosis, where mitochondria and chloroplasts originated as prokaryotes, and also the relationship between soil bacteria and plants, 